welcome to Homeschool Made Easy. I am excited this is a special first on the Homeschool Made Easy live show. We are actually going live not only in the Homeschool Made Easy Facebook page, but or Facebook group, I should say, but also in our YouTube page. If you go to YouTube Leanne Garfius, you'll find that from now on, Lord willing, we will go live there at 2 p.m. Central as well, so you can join if you're a YouTuber and you prefer that platform. Come and join us. You can still ask questions and participate in the discussion. So be sure to check us out on YouTube as well. Today we're talking about something that is so interesting to me. And I worked on it with my little kids, but kind of let it fall by the wayside. And that's memory work. I think a lot of us hear about memory work in our homeschool, especially when we're reading about morning basket or other activities we can do with our younger children. I remember when my kids were in preschool and elementary ages, I liked to memorize scripture verses and poems with them. But as they got older, it seemed like after we got some poems and verses under our belt, we moved into rules, like spelling rules and grammar rules and preposition lists and, and multiplication facts and a lot of boring memory things. And I ended up putting aside the really beautiful memory work and then getting burned out on the boring stuff. So today I'm really excited to have Amy Sloan here with us from Humility and Doxology. You may have seen her on her popular Instagram and Facebook accounts, but she's here today to talk to us about what memory work really should be and how to incorporate it in a fun way in our homeschool. So thank you so much for coming and helping us out with this, Amy. Thank you for having me. This is one of my favorite topics, so you it's hard to get me to stop talking about it. <laughs> That's good. Well, before we get into the nitty gritty, tell us a little bit about yourself and your homeschooling and how you got into memory work. So uh, like you said, my name is Amy. I'm a second generation homeschooler. I was homeschooled all the way through high school graduation. I'm married to a wonderful husband, John. He was homeschooled through seventh grade. Uh, and so both second generation homeschoolers. We have five kids currently six to 16 years old. And it has been a wonderful adventure to homeschool them, often challenging, but definitely the best hard thing that I do. Um, I started off on this sort of memory work adventure because I had all of these big goals, these big ideals when I started homeschooling. I wanted to prioritize beautiful poetry and Shakespeare historic documents and speeches, scripture passages, these things that I thought were truly important and had eternal significance. And then I actually started homeschooling and I was finding that the reality of my daily life was not matching those ideals that I had set up. And I was so discouraged because especially as a second generation homeschooler, I was going to do all the good stuff my mom had done and you know, also make it perfect, not do any of her mistakes. And, <laughs> you know, the Lord was faithful to humble me in that way. And so it was really discouraging, actually, because I felt like we would always do our math. We would do those essentials. And then I was tired and the kids were tired and nobody wanted to sit around and talk about poetry. <laughs> so a few years into my homeschool journey, I heard this idea from people like Sarah McKenzie, Pam Barnhill, and others about morning time. I was like, oh, you mean I get to do that stuff first? That's okay? And that transformed our homeschool and it transformed the way I approached memory work to be able to start our day with those beautiful things. Not only gets our entire homeschool day started off on like a really good track, right? Like we're all starting with something that's beautiful, uh, but it made sure we got to it. Just sometimes that's that practical thing, like a small tweak. So you actually get to something that's important to you. So it was a way to like bring my priorities into my reality. And that's what Jenny Herman is saying while she's watching. She says, I get that reality not matching what's in my head. So even though 
let's get a little bit of head. Even though you have, now that you have this idea of how to incorporate memory work in the beginning of your day, does that mean your your visualization in your mind of what you want this to be like? Is it happening? It really is. God has been so good. And the, the memory work that we memorize all together, all the ages together, oh, many, many years now, has become something that binds our own hearts together. It's those inside jokes, the the lines of poetry we share together, the scripture that fills our mind, the memories, the read aloud, you know, all those all those wonderful things that we have done together. Um, is definitely my favorite part of the homeschool day. And I think it is for many, if not all of my children as well. So your children are memorizing together your high schoolers down to your early learners? Yes. So that's something I think that a lot of people don't realize. They maybe think about memory work, lists of facts, lists of dates and dead people, uh, lists of, like you mentioned, spelling rules, math drills. And some of those facts, of course, are important for us to know. But those are going to be harder to incorporate with a, a wide age range. And those weren't necessarily the things I wanted to prioritize. We, as homeschool moms, we know our lives get busy and full. There's just not time to do all the things. So sometimes you have to decide what's most important. And for me, the things that were most important were things that were true and beautiful. So things like scripture, longer scripture passages even, poetry, uh, historic documents and speeches. And those were things we could all do together. So what I do is I literally – just print out, say, the poem or the scripture passage, and we all read it aloud together. Now, my pre-readers obviously are just listening, but it's amazing how quickly even those little ones really learn what you're just simply reading together. And sometimes people will be like, I'm not sure if that's really true, but I like to remind people of when their little one was like three years old and had that favorite bedtime story. And if you were tired and you tried to skip a page or skip a line, they knew you had you had skipped something, right? And all you had ever done was read that book out loud to them, and it had sunk down into their heart. So memory work, it doesn't have to be complicated. I'm not sitting there as the tester, you know, drilling back bits and pieces of information with my children. This is something we're all doing together. We're just reading and enjoying the words sometimes discussing what it means. And over the course of a month, it's actually amazing how quickly we will learn those poems and scripture passages, hymns and psalms. So this is what I'm a little bit confused about. My 14-year-old, for example, is going to memorize rather quickly and understand, like, if I want to memorize the preamble of the Constitution, because we're studying the Constitution right now, well, my 10-year-olds, and even if I had even younger kids, they're not going to enjoy, um, understand the words or the structure or the concepts as well as my high schooler. So my high schooler is going to memorize it and understand it rather quickly, but it's going to take forever for the little kids. How do you keep them on the same page, literally? <laughs> yeah, good question. So, of course, our older students are going to understand what's going on in a more complicated passage, like the preamble to the Constitution. They're going to understand it more deeply. Um, you can go – Not, I wouldn't overdo it, but maybe I'll mention like one or two words in a day. Like, hey, does anyone know what this word or phrase means? not overdoing it. So it's like, oh, mom's going to lecture us again because the focus needs to be on just the lyricism of the words. But um, over the course of time, the younger ones will actually pick up on more than we maybe would think they do. And even if they don't fully understand the preamble, the next time through when we review that in a few years, it's going to be much easier for them the second time around to remember it. And they'll have sort of that foundation for understanding. So you're reviewing your stuff periodically or you do you have it in a cycle because you mentioned in a few years? 
Yeah. So it depends on the particular piece of memory work. In my family, history is really important to us. And we learn that without a textbook. I like to, to put together my own history. So a lot of our memory work will be related to what we're studying in history, sometimes in science. You can do whatever you want. Sometimes it's just because I like a poem and I want us to learn it. Uh-huh. But with, with that, with history, it'll more naturally come up again in the future. Mm-hmm. And then other times, I will just purpose, you know what, it's been about three, four years since we did that poem. It's time to put it back into the rotation so the younger kids get a chance to learn it again. Yes. Um, that reminds me that when, back when my children were younger, I made them memorize a Psalm of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I think the greatest poem ever written. I don't know why. It just speaks to me on a deeper level. And they got tired of saying it all the time because for a while we just recited it every day at lunch because I really wanted to keep it in their minds until they got sick of it. So how do you, (laughs) how do you walk this fine line between drilling it enough or reviewing it enough and not overdoing it? How much do you, how long do you dwell on something? This is where we have to remember we're in charge of our own homeschools. So what works for my family, you know, may be tweaked for another family. And I think you as a mom kind of know when people are getting sick of a particular passage. There's too many good things in the world to memorize. To It's supposed to be a joyful time together. So if everyone's like, not again, that's probably a sign to put that one aside and move on to something new. Uh, in my family, because actually probably I'm the one who gets bored more quickly, is we generally do a set of memory work a month. So I will pick a different poem, a different psalm or hymn, uh, some other piece of memory work. We'll focus on that for one month. And then when the new month comes, we'll change it up. That also gives me the ability to do holiday themed memory work, like at Christmas time or Thanksgiving. We love Shakespeare. So about every other month will be a Shakespeare-themed month. I was actually just this morning typing up Merchant of Venice recitation pieces for our October, which I'm excited about. It's one of my favorite plays. And so that kind of keeps things fresh. By the end of the month, when we're all kind of like, really, we have to do this one again? It's time to change it and move on. So I kind of have built that into our memory work routine. So you're actually studying several pieces at the same time. Did you say three different things you're working on in a month? So like this month, at the end of September, we did a short poem by Emily Dickinson called Autumn. We have been singing through Psalm 37, and we were reciting the Nicene Creed. Those were sort of our our focuses of memory work. Oh, and we were doing um, a memory passage from Second Chronicles. Wow. First Chronicles. So you, so you had four things going at once. <laughs> yes. And because all we're doing is we're reading it together, it really doesn't take that much time. I mean, we can do all of that and pray and read a Bible story um, and do a read aloud within like 30 minutes. I think sometimes we build it up in our heads like it's going to take a long time. But if you just read a chapter of the Bible at once, it's only a couple minutes. So... It doesn't take as long as you might think. Wow. Okay. So go through that again. You're you're starting. What are you starting off with? Break this thirty minutes down for me. Okay, I would love to, and I'll. I should have had it with me so that I didn't miss anything. Um, I have it. I actually share our monthly morning time plans for free on my blog. So if I miss something, you can always double check me there. But we start with prayer. Then I read a, a bit from a story Bible. And that's mainly for my littlest guy. That's something especially for him, but everyone sits in for that as well. We do our Bible verse memory work next. And I find it's easiest for Bible passages to do them responsively. So I'll type it up and alternate verse by verse, light print and dark print. So I'll read the light print. They'll read the dark print. And on different days, people will take turns being the leader. Helps us be focused on a longer passage. Okay, so Bible verse, then read aloud for a short time. 
Then we do our poem, our creed, we sing a psalm, and the kids pray. So it's like eight things. That's about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on discussion depending on how long we read aloud together. So when you're memorizing this, what is the process for memorization? We have to ask ourselves, what do we mean by memory work? And maybe yes. I should have started there to begin with because people do have sort of a lot of times, honestly, a negative assumption or like feeling about words like memory, memorization, things like that. It feels like a drill and kill, like something just dead that you're just sticking in your brain that has no meaning or something. But I like to use the term knowing by heart because I think that gives like a little different perspective. Hmm. Now, not every child will have these things word perfect, you know, where they could fill out a test on them or something like that. But all of these things have sunk into our hearts. The, the truth and the beauty are forming the way we think and the way we see the world, the world, the way we understand our neighbors, even uh, learning from the perspectives of others. So it's okay to me if not every child is word perfect. Honestly, they're probably better than I am. I have to cheat by the time they're looking up from their papers. And that's okay because I don't want this to be a test. The goal of this is to know by heart, to really change the way we're thinking about the world. And I, I think about, you know, if my children were in a dark time, you know, and I was like, if you were in prison or all alone somewhere, you know, what is going to serve them best in that moment of trial, that moment of darkness, we all face those trials. Is it going to be able to like rattle off a date of a battle? But no, that's not going to help them. But if they can remember Death Be Not Proud by John Donne, that's going to give them true comfort in that time. And so when I think about memorization, when I think about why we're doing it, how we're doing it, that really um, affects the way I think about things. Mind blown. So memory time... I don't have to worry so much about the preamble of the Constitution. I'm stuck on that because I really did want to familiarize them with it. But you're giving me permission for that. We can be familiar with it and go over it almost every day. I'm not going to commit to five days a week, four weeks out of the month. But we can go through it almost every day, and they're going to benefit. Yes. I don't have to put that pressure. See, that's another reason that for me and maybe for some of my friends listening we don't do this whole memory work thing because we think we're not my kids aren't good memorizers or as my son told me today he asked me who I was speaking with today on the show and I said Amy Sloan she's an expert on memory work in your homeschool he's like mom you called me by the wrong name three times this morning alone. Why are you talking about memory work? This is not for you. <laughs> you make me feel so much better about this, Amy. Oh, I'm really thankful. I'm really passionate about this, and I want moms to catch that exact vision, like you're saying, right? How many times do we think we have to like do it perfectly for it to count or for it to be worth doing? And whether it's memory work or anything else in our homeschool, I, I like to say like the imperfect thing that you actually do is always better than the perfect thing you never start. And it doesn't have to be perfect to count. Just pick one small thing and do it faithfully with your kids and it will have an effect. Whether they could fill out a worksheet on it or not doesn't really matter. The decor that reminds me of the decorating expert, the nester, Mike Quillen Smith, um, says it doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful, and that's exactly what you're saying. It, this can be a beautiful moment in our homeschool, our morning time or lunch time or afternoon or whenever we um, sit together with our children. 
doesn't have to be perfect. We don't have to look like a Pinterest picture. We don't have to look like some kind of expert doing everything step by step or even do exactly what Amy is doing, but it can still be a beautiful moment in our homeschool. Yeah, definitely. So how do I choose... I mean, you have some great resources, but in and of myself and my friends listening, what are some criteria we should use in picking out what kinds of things to be studying? It may surprise you. My first response is actually to ask mom what she likes. I think that mom's enthusiasm is kind of the secret sauce in homeschooling (laughs) and If we have something that we are really excited about, oh, guys, I can't wait for you to hear this poem or read this speech or, oh, my goodness, I love this little passage from Shakespeare or whatever it is that gets you excited. If we can bring that enthusiasm, that is going to be communicated so much to our kids. If we're come and we're like, well, some lady on the internet told me I was supposed to memorize this. (laughs) And you're just like, this is the worst. I hate this. Okay, the kids are going to pick up on that too. And no one's going to be having any fun. So I really like, hey, mom, if there is a song you like, like songs, the lyrics of songs are are poems, really. Um, Or if there's a poem you just remember liking, it doesn't have to be the greatest poem in the world. Like start with something that you're excited about. So Bohemian Rhapsody, we can start off by singing that. (laughs) A hundred percent. No, for real. (laughs) I love that. I created this playlist for my kids of all the music from like past decades. I needed to make sure they, they knew that was on there. (laughs) Yeah, it has to be. Everyone needs to to be able to sing it by heart. You never know when you're just required to. Exactly. And then after that, like, okay, okay, I'm really excited about a lot of things. I do think another easy thing to do is to look at what you're already learning. You know, don't, add another burden to your to-do list, look for something that coordinates with your history, with your science. You know, you're learning about the weather, learn a poem about rain. Uh, Or, you know, there can be all sorts of ways to integrate your memory work with what you're already learning. So those would be two tips, I think. So are you giving everyone this material? Like, do they have it on paper? Are you printing it off for them? Or are they just listening to you reading it? No, they don't listen to my voice. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> <laughs> I print it all out. Everybody has it. We slip it in those little plastic uh, protectors that can go in your three-ring binder. So everybody just flips to the next thing. We all read it together. We move on to the next thing. Um, Everyone has the order that we're going to go in. I print that out for everybody, too. Just everyone's on the same page, quite literally. Literally. They have their own copies because I've learned this is not the time to teach sharing. (laughs) One Uh, lesson at a time, people. That's right. (laughs) This is supposed to be fun. (laughs) Yes. Oh, that's funny. So Jenny Herman, I love her idea. She says, I'm going to do some spunky monkey and funky donkey lines from Shel Silverstein. When I was a child, I loved Silverstein. So I am going to have to get out my, my books and pick those because kids love Shel Silverstein. He's so silly, right? Yes. So- we did his Me Who and Exactly What poem. That's really funny. Another really funny poem by Jack Proletsky is Be Glad Your Nose Is On Your Face. <laughs> and then, of course, Jabberwocky. Who doesn't love oh, like yes. a good Lewis Carroll silly poem? I'm going to do that. Oh, I should do that this month in October because that's a nice spooky one for Halloween. Yes. It gives you a different perspective on Halloween, I think. Okay, so other than those, what are some of your favorite things that you've memorized with your children? Or learned by heart, I should say. <laughs> yes. So just don't ask, you know, like... Cite them on the spot. (laughs) So I did mention John Donne, uh, Death Be Not Proud. I love that poem. And that is one of the very first things we ever memorized together. And actually, it comes up a lot in conversations with the kids in connection to either real life events or things they're studying. So I'm really thankful we learned that one. We've really enjoyed learning Shakespeare together. And there is nothing quite so delightful as seeing my kids like, 
reciting Shakespeare in the living room to each other. That's just really fun. Uh, so I think those would be two immediately that come to mind. And then I think just being able to memorize longer passages of scripture together. I love like a verse at a time is great too, obviously. But I love like a whole chapter because you see the logic of the way God thinks and the way he communicates in that flow. So I really love learning longer passages with them. When you're talking about Shakespeare, I think a lot of us would really be drawn to helping our children know more Shakespeare because, right, what homeschooler doesn't want their child to know a little Shakespeare? That's just great for when you're in the grocery store and someone says, why aren't you in school? Well, if they start quoting Shakespeare, everyone will feel better about that conversation. <laughs> but what do you choose from Shakespeare? Are you doing his sonnets? We have done some sonnets in the past. But what I really love to do is pick like a play. So uh, we did Macbeth in August by request of one of my teens. <laughs> We're doing Merchant of Venice in October. And so I'll start by reading a children's retelling. I love Charles and Mary Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare. Me too. So everyone kind of like knows what's happening in the plot. Uh -huh. And then I will pick a few important longer passages, like a famous monologue or something like that. So maybe one to three, depending on how long they are, how excited I get. Um, <laughs> and then I will do another page just of short quips, like little famous lines from the play. And so we'll just start reading those aloud. Again, we just read them aloud together very melodramatically. We love to get melodramatic. Weird accents, you know, sword motions with our hands, all that. And then I like to show them clips from Shakespeare films. You cannot show most Shakespeare <laughs> films to children, just no, to be Shakes clear. Shakespeare gets a little spicy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so what I have done is I've created playlists on my YouTube channel of like short child appropriate clips. Okay. And of course, all parents like preview first because every child is different. Every family is different. But that's been really fun because Shakespeare was never designed to be read like a book or studied. You know, it was supposed to be seen. It's a play. Yes. So when you see these amazing actors interpreting the lines you're learning, mm -hmm. even little ones, it's amazing. Even my young kids, you think, oh, they can't understand what's going on. They will laugh at the appropriate moments. And that's how you know. They may not get every detail. But again, they're understanding that big picture. My my children love A Midsummer Night's Dream. They find that the most hilarious thing. Now, I think it's kind of, I'm going to um, give an unpopular opinion. I think Shakespeare in Midsummer Night's Dream is stupid. Like, really stupid. It's my least thing he ever wrote. I it's not one of my favorites thinking. either. But kids think it's hilarious. There is a donkey, and Shakespeare calls it by the biblical term for donkey. I'm not going to say it in case you're going to be offended. But if you just read it like that, I mean, kids are going to die laughing. There are oh, just, yeah. The puns on that name are just hilarious. But um, so... Kids can really enjoy Shakespeare, especially with a retelling like Lambs. That's really good. So, okay, what about if your child just isn't into this, especially probably when they're teens is when this happens more often, or preteens. But, you know, they're like mumbling, they're not getting into it, they're, you know, this is so stupid, or I don't like this poem. How do you, what are you doing to help keep them involved? Well, I will say first, thankfully, if there are moms watching who have younger children, if you can start this when they're young, you get to brainwash them. <laughs> My <laughs> teens still like it. I mean, they have grumpy days, but mm -hmm. they're, they're not like, oh, brother, not this again. Yeah. But if you're starting with older kids, you're going to really need to get their buy-in. Mm -hmm. And so maybe instead of starting with what gets mom excited, start with something that gets them excited. Are they really into baseball? Is there something baseball themed related? Um, some something related to science that they're interested in? It may not be the most beautiful thing you've ever heard, but if you can kind of work with something they're excited about, mm -hmm. or give them a poetry anthology and be like, you can pick anything from this book, and everybody in the family, even mom, has to say it out loud. Wow! I mean, if you, you give them that, you know. You picked the right anthology, so you're willing to say anything. 
but like get their buy-in and yeah. so you know and then pray with them because you're not the holy spirit and if they're grumpy like you can't make them not be grumpy memory work doesn't change the soul oh, um no. <laughs> yeah sorry that's the holy spirit's job oh, again <laughs> right you mean this won't save my children either oh man <laughs> So we've got some ideas from literature and history is probably speeches and documents, right? Mm -hmm. Not dates and battles. <laughs> Not so much. What are some ideas? You keep mentioning science. What are some ideas for getting science into my memory time? Well, so there are poems, like depending on what you're seeing that you find. But I actually like even say you're studying the human body. I've taught my kids the bones, the body, to the tune, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. So, okay, maybe this is, like, beautiful. But I will tell you, I learned this as a homeschooled child. And it has served me so well to act like I am an educated human being when I'm just, you know, talking to doctors. Uh -huh. Medical professionals are so impressed when I'm like, oh, when, you know, oh, by the patella is where he has this pain. And they're like. Oh, really? You know, so that's something uh, kind of silly you can do. Are you really quick standing in the office, touching your head and your shoulders and your knees? And you're just right. like, oh. Hey, which one? <laughs> Clavicle. No, no, sternum. <laughs> <laughs> there can be fun things like that. And that's too, like you can stand up and move around, which is especially good with little ones. Uh -huh. And, you know, and mom, you can't worry about looking ridiculous. You just have to be willing to be silly and let it go. <laughs> of your homeschooling anyway. Just yeah, it's okay. Up. It's fine. <laughs> All right. So what are some other things we need to know about using memory work in our homes? Well, I think sit starting simple. Don't try to go tomorrow and be like, I'm going to start this new thing. It's going to be great. Here's an hour's worth of memory work. Just pick one thing and do it and then do it the next day and then do it the day after that. Again, just start small, start simple build from that, right? Don't look to this as the one bullet that's going to fix everything, the magic bullet, you know, that's going to transform your homeschool because that's too much pressure to put on anything in our homeschool. Um, I would say those two things and then just have fun. This is supposed to be a joy, not just for the kids, but for mom too, because it's really about that, that culture building that relationship time together, having that common vocabulary that you can share with your kids. So really focus on that relational side. And if you can prioritize that, I think the rest will come. That's really good. I am going to, fortunately, while we're recording this, the, it's the last 30 days of September. Yes, this is the last day of September. <laughs> See, I, anyway. Memory work. See, you knew that because of the I poem. Knew. Yes, 30 days have September, April, June, and November. Okay, this is September 30th, so it's the last day of September. So I'm going to spend some time this afternoon looking for some things for October. I already know I want to do, as I keep saying, the preamble of the Constitution because we're studying the beginning of our country right now in history. And I think I'm going to look for a poem about fall because it's not fall here in Texas. <laughs> so to help us get into the mood. And um, our church, this is nice. Maybe you can pick um, some of you who are listening. Look at what your child is learning in Sunday school or in church. Our church is memorizing verses together as a church. But like Amy suggested, I can um, put together or, or pull out a longer passage that's around it to help give us some context. So there's three things. I think I'll start with three. I love that. <laughs> do people usually do four? Is more better? What's the sweet spot here? I think you are the boss of your family and you get to decide. No you are. I keep telling them I'm the boss, but it's not working, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, joking aside, I don't know. I, I get excited by putting things together and I like adding a lot of things. For another mom, that might be overwhelming and terrifying. So I would say, you know, do what works best for your family. And you're not plan. So if you start and you're like, three is too much, take one out. If you start and you're like, this is so awesome, I want to add more. 
you can add another one, even in the middle of the month. And then Leanne ends up with seven or eight because she's just that way and the kids' eyes are glazing over and an hour and a half later, my, my son's like, I'm never going to get my algebra done, mom, let me go. Yeah, that algebra has to happen sometime. Yes. All right, tell us some more about your resources that you have available to help us with the memory work. So over at humilityanddoxology.com, uh, you can go to the top on the menu page and go to the year of memory work. I think you shared that link as well. That's 52 weeks of free printables, video recitations uh, for a year of memory work, poetry, scripture passages, historic documents. I also have my monthly morning time and memory work plans, like literally what I'm actually doing with my family. I just put them up in a very non-formatted blog post so you can get those and my email subscribers can download those pdfs for free um yeah so i think those would be the two places i would start that is really great uh, that's something i'm gonna look at right now <laughs> as soon as we hang up here and um i do have links to all of this in the show notes so make sure friends who are listening that you check it out what else does humility and doxology your company provide for the homeschool community well, bi-weekly, you can listen to my podcast. That's the Homeschool Conversations with Humility and Doxology podcast. And that's really fun to get to chat with all sorts of different homeschool moms and dads and educators on a wide range of topics. So you can find that, the full transcripts for those episodes, if you like to read, you can find them on the website. You can listen to the audio in your podcast feed or watch the videos on YouTube. And then I also have a textbook free history uh, masterclass available and lots of history resources to kind of come at history from this joy and delight filled perspective. Oh, that's really great. I learned so much about memory work, AKA learning by heart. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy, for coming on and talking with us. Thank you for having me. This has been fun. Oh, it's really great. And for those of you who are listening or watching in our Facebook group or watching on our new YouTube channel, be sure that you continue, whether you're using memory work, learning by heart, your morning time together, or however you're working in your homeschool, remember to continue to teach the way you teach best for the way that your student learns best, and that's how you can make homeschool easy. We'll talk to you next week.